Story time with Stephanie Story. Hi, welcome to Story Time. I am art historical novelist Stephanie Story, and my guest today is a tech consultant and business tech writer and other kinds of writers which we will talk about. Uh, but her novel that she is here to talk about today, which came out on April 7th, same as my book birthday, ah, it was a scary time to release a novel, is called Greedy Heart. It is about Wall Street and greed and sex and the financial markets and all of those things. Uh, welcome to the show, A.P. Murray. Thanks so much. I'm happy to be here. Uh, so I started with, we both had a book launch on April 7th. How did it go for you? I think I'm still in the midst of finding out. I, I started to sort of, you know, just kind of put the blinders on and not really focus on the fact that my book was coming out in the midst of a pandemic. And then I think, I think for most things you know this is my debut so it's not like i had anything to compare it to so for most things you sort of have to just sit and wait especially when you're launching i have done nonfiction books before but you know i think unless you're sort of like on oprah or something there's there's sort of a deafening silence and you you end up saying how's it going how about now how about now how about now Maybe it's the same during a pandemic as any time. Yeah, no, it's definitely weirder. Let me tell you, this is my second one. The first one was very different. Um, okay, but my question, so now I'm wondering, if you just now got to debut novel, have you always wanted to write fiction? Has this been lifelong dream that is suddenly fulfilled now, or is this a new endeavor? Oh gosh, yes. No, I I have wanted to write novels since I picked up my first novel and enjoyed it in third grade, which maybe means I was a little late to the show. But um, you know, sometimes I think actually, truly, it's easier to tackle things that aren't sort of as dear to your heart it, it, than it is to tackle things that are dear to your heart. When I read my first novel, which was this story about a Jewish family on the Lower East Side in the 30s, I think, called All of a Kind Family. Um, I, I was like, what is this strange magic? And I, I was so transported by it that I really thought it must be some kind of special sorcerer who's able to do this kind of thing. And, and then I think it really took me a long time to really figure out that human beings can do this because there are human beings out there doing this and that I could do it. But I, I had a long way around to doing it. I thought, you know, journalism, and then I started a tech company. A lot of things that a lot of people would consider maybe as hard as writing a novel. Were they? Were they as hard as writing a novel? Or was it not? Which one, which part, okay, journalism, tech companies, tech writing, business writing, this, which has been the hardest on, on the journey so far? Or are they, are they just so different you can't compare them? Well, first of all, I, I, I think that hard is often between your ears, right? So I still think that the literal hardest thing I ever did was teaching high school. And I, I did that for five years and I loved it. I adored it. But in terms of like opening a vein every day and it's physically hard, it's emotionally hard, it's spiritually hard. We're talking about hard, that was the hardest thing I ever did. And the lowest paid. Um, but I think that writing my, starting a company and running a tech company is super hard. I'm, I'm not gonna lie to you. Um, but the part about writing a novel that's so challenging is that it's very close to the bone. You know, you can you, you can have a hard time separating what you've created from you yourself. And that part, I think, was hard for me to get over myself and just plow through and, and not have a, you know, a failure in business is a failure in business. It's hard. Nobody, nobody likes it. Nobody's like, oh, I'd like to have a failure in business today. Um, but it doesn't, for me anyway, because it wasn't that thing that was dear to my heart, it didn't make me question my very existence on the planet. <laughs> right. But writing novels did, which I get. Oh, sure. 
<laughs> yes. First, before we get any further, please tell my viewers at home a little short description of your book so they can keep up because I, I'm always afraid I will butcher plots like yours when I try to- It's awful them. hard to distill a book. So, so my book, it's the story of a woman's journey from greed. What my main character, Delia, wants is money. She comes from a family that had money, that lost it during what she calls the great family financial disaster of 1986. <laughs> and she spends many years kind of mushing around and then decides she's going to do it. She's going to get a PhD in mathematics. She's going to come back as a quant on Wall Street and she is going to make back her lost fortune. And then she has to figure out how much of her soul she's going to put on the line to do that. So the first part of the novel is entitled Greed. It's in two distinct parts. Mm -hmm. And you might guess that the next half of the novel is entitled Heart. Okay, so why was this the story that you had to tell as your, as your first at this moment in your life? However you want to couch that, why was this the story that grabbed you? And, and then I'm going to ask why it was the question that made you question your existence. Okay. So um, I had the character of Delia and basic outlines of the story, interestingly, before, just before the 2008 crash, probably around 2007. I was taking notes, I was writing early drafts, I wasn't really getting around to it. I, and, the, and my idea was, I, I moved around a lot as a kid. I, I, ha, I went to like six different schools before I went to college. So I knew what it was like to move and to lose a home and to feel not at home. So my idea for the story was someone who would discover the importance of home. Then the 2008 financial crash hit. And that was all about really treating a home and a mortgage as if it was a stock that you could trade. And millions of people lost their homes because the market has just exploited the idea of home as leverage. And there was just something about that that really spoke to me and crystallized what a journey. So if you want a character to have a, a, a satisfying arc in a story, you know, if you want them to end up here, they, they kind of have to start down here, right? So if, if home and values are where you want to end up, what's the opposite of that? Well, as I lived through the 2008 crash unfolding, it turned out to me like the opposite of that was greed, that everything's commoditized, that everything has a price, that nothing doesn't have a price. And the opposite of a character who has a, you know, beautiful values and values home is someone for whom everything has a price. What was interesting was I had done a ton of research. I'm, I'm a tech person by background, and I was becoming fascinated with the role that technology plays on Wall Street and the financial markets. So I was actually in the process of inventing a crash called, caused by technology. And I was like, wait a minute. <laughs> I don't have to invent a crash. What is happening? As you are watching this, this current financial crisis is obviously extraordinarily different than the 2008 one, but, and it's, it's causes are different and how it's going to play out are completely different. But in the way you explored the 08 crisis in your novel, did that shed any light for you on this current crisis? Is it giving you a different perspective that the rest of us don't have that we need? Well, yeah, I mean, I don't know. I mean, I think everybody now is getting a ton of perspective, but I think I agree with you. I think that we don't quite know what's happening in the markets right now. Um, but I went, I wrote a blog for Medium that got picked up and just getting tens of thousands of hits. And I wrote this before the pandemic and it's called, it's called um, what'll cause the next financial crash. And I got it totally wrong. I didn't say there was going to be a pandemic. What I was starting to explore was the fact that we, the underpinnings of the economy are 
like built on sand. The, the trends, which were not stopped after 2008, of people being in debt. The, we're sort of ashamed, all of us are ashamed to say the truth, which is, I haven't saved enough for retirement. I'm not sure how long I could survive without a paycheck. Maybe I live paycheck to paycheck because there's this shame that maybe comes from the depression generation or, or the, the, gen, the baby boomer generation where people really could. You know, you started out, you weren't in, you were in that student loan debt. Maybe you got married and your aunts and uncles gave you enough of a down payment on a house. But basically you started out at a starting line. If you're starting out down here already in debt, you sort of never get out of debt. And, you, and if you can't get health care, and so the level of indebtedness of the average American and the inability to fall back on any cushion is what we are living through now. And that is the same, the causes are the same as the greed and the income inequality and the 1% and all that kind of stuff and banks not lending to normal Joes. That's the same as 2008. But since the second half of your book is about heart and your, your protagonist finding morals in heart, what are your hopes for how all of us will come out on the other side of this and get away from some of the greed and the, and the income inequality that has been plaguing our society? Do you have hopes? Do you lay at night thinking about the second half of this pan pandemic in the same way your second half of your novel goes? I do, I really do. I mean, I was reading in the New York Times today about how, how you know, the depression reshapes society because you can do things on the back of a crisis that you couldn't do in normal times. So we have an opportunity to do that. Um, I, I think that, so that's the, that's the hopeful upside of this. The challenging part and the part that I sort of walk through with my main character is in order for, let's say people who are disadvantaged, whether that's women or minorities or a segment of the country or whatever, whatever that is, in order for those people to get something, somebody else has to give up something. And, and it's the giving up something that's the hard part. And that requires moral fiber. And, and, like, a, and like a value system that transcends, you know, I don't know, your yacht or something, or your plane. You are in New York right now going through this. I'm not, I'm, I'm tucked away, away from humanity sort of by design during the shelter in place time but you're in the middle of Manhattan. How has it, just tell me how it's been from your perspective, because it, for those of us who are not in New York, we're all watching it from the outside, like, oh my, has it, has it felt as bad as it looked like from the outside? Has everybody been so sheltered in place they don't know? What's it been like? No, it, it's been um, shaken me and my husband to our core. Um, and again, that one's still unfolding. I think we're in, we're more adjusted now. I live on 83rd street in Madison okay. and we had, I took a walk one day. I don't know. I wanted to get out and buy a cucumber or something. And I walked by my first sighting, like, you know, 15 feet away from one of the refrigerated trucks that they brought in to be temporary morgues, right next to the local hospital where my sister gave birth to my nephew. And that, you know, you, you can't, I, I don't think I've still processed it. No. And then I was walking my dog and I hadn't been listening to the news because I had to take a break. This was a few weeks ago. I was walking my dog and I'm like, what's that 10 city? And of course, it was the COVID tent city that they built in the East Meadow to house the patients that were expected. So all of that is, has been, and that's day to day. All of this feels so connected 
all of these big issues and all the, you have also been a woman who's run your own companies and you've been in, in, in business and you're dealing with that in fiction. That has been a huge, prior to the pandemic, the biggest issue on the planet felt like me too forever. Right. Um, so how important is that to you to be dealing with female protagonists coming up against these business issues? How are you dealing with sort of that and, and processing that part of what you write about? I think I came to that those issues pretty well formed. I, I was delighted by the Me Too movement. Those of us who've been living it for a very long time were feeling like, well, it's about time. Uh, so, so I feel like that part of it, I have sort of well grounded. I can draw on myriad experiences of what it's like to attempt to be successful and powerful in a world, in any, in any profession. I mean, honestly, my feeling is like some professions we regard as female, like teaching you could regard as female. But if you look at the structure that surrounds teaching, the administrative structure, you know, so, so that part, I think the challenge has been that and I really, I fell into this. I, I wrote a character who starts out really greedy. She's like, I want money. I didn't think a thing of it. You know, I'm, I'm running a tech company. I'm running meetings every day. I, you know, I, I, I'm the boss. And I got some early feedback going like, wow, she's hard to take. And I thought to myself, okay, I expected a lot of reactions. That one kind of surprised me because she's also super humorous. She says, God has been replaced by spinning and kale. I mean, you know, she's just, she's got a million laughs in her. She doesn't take herself that seriously. But if you start out with a woman who's, but she's very powerful and she's very smart and she knows it. And it remind the reaction reminded me of what a difficult tightrope it is to walk as a woman and, or, and maintain your likability. Can can you? I just, I think you, you know, you, you can. Um, there's a formula that I follow, and it involves uh, a, a certain level of warmth and um, striking a, a kind of a motherliness, and only draw. I mean, but you have to be really careful about how you spend your chips. So if you are going to draw the line, or um, or, 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 or say enough is enough, or whatever kind of harder message you have to deliver, you got to build up to that with a lot of warmth and motherliness. And power is almost always interpreted as unlikable. Raising your voice, unlikable. I know. Not smiling, unlikable. So it's a, it's a tightrope. It really, you can walk, you're going to fall off sometimes, and that's just the way it is. You're going to fall off. Somebody's going to be like, wow, she was a real, you know, what in that meeting. Um, so that happens, and it's going to happen. But the reality is that you have to find ways, of, if you're going to do it, you have to find ways of coping. Have you found ways of coping? Are you finding new ways of coping through the characters you're writing? Well, I think the characters I'm writing are informed by my, you know, 25 years in business of, of coping. Mm -hmm. um, and I let them fall down into the, into the pits of unlikability and so forth, because I kind of know where those, those guardrails are. Uh, I, I do, I, listen, I am very grateful to my career because it's allowed me, and being the boss and running my own company, because it's allowed me the flexibility to do other things that are important to me. So if you wanted to be a novelist since you were in the third grade, since you first picked up that magical book that you thought this person's a sorcerer, how can I do this? And you wait and you have a 25 year career before you do it. I was the same thing. My debut came out when I was 40. Are you glad for the time you took to publish your debut novel? Is there good and bad? Where's your, what's your feeling on that? Well, I think the path probably had to be what the path was. Um, I think that 
if I were going to say, what could I have learned earlier or done earlier? And this is advice that I give to young women now. Uh, in, in order to do something, so you always have the to-do list. And as, as you know, you know, nobody, well, few people get to sort of just write a novel. Like here, the world is gonna give you X number of years of no interruption and just sit there and write. I mean, we don't dream of that. I mean, on Facebook, we're all like, I just want quiet time to write, you know? But that never happens. So you have to be able to, to give yourself the time to do this thing for yourself. Now, that could be anything. That could be starting a yoga practice. You know, I don't know what it is, but for me, it was writing. And I think that giving myself the permission to not take a meeting before 10, to if I have a day off, to use it on not catching up on email, but making progress in writing, mm -hmm. that part, that's the between your ears part. Yeah. Where if you don't do that for yourself, and if you look for someone else to give you permission to do that, it's not going to happen. Mm -hmm. So you have to get over yourself. And I, I think it took me a very long time to be able to give myself that. And then, by the way, the idea that you're going you have you're you're going to be uncomfortable doing it. You know, the idea that you're going to do it and suddenly, oh, you know, angels will sing and you know, and and that so that the, you know, between eight and ten every morning for those first few years that I was writing, I was a guilty, neurotic mess. Everything that I wasn't gonna, wasn't doing was piling up. I was torturing myself, breaking out in acne. I mean, it was just, it was, it was too much. And I just had to muscle through and prove to myself that the world wasn't gonna end. It's like people who don't take a vacation. And then they didn't get a vacation, they learned the world didn't end. Mm -hmm. So your, your customers are gonna be irritated that you can't take a meeting at 845. And your, you know, your, your employees are gonna say, well, I don't, you know, no one is going to help you do it. You have to do it and deal with the discomfort. And then after, I'm gonna say six months, a year, it gets baked into your life. Everybody's adjusted mm -hmm. and it's okay. You know, I don't have children. So for me, the head trick I performed on myself was, well, if I had a baby, I'd have to leave work early and everybody would go, oh, she has a baby. Mm -hmm. So I don't have a baby, I have a novel. So I'm going to pretend like it's my baby mm -hmm. and all of that helped. So yeah, that part was part that I had to sort through and could have done sooner if I had really not spent X number of years, whatever number of years we spent avoiding that thing that we're terrified to do. Okay. I love that. I, I, I had like 800 more questions for you. So the next time you have a book out, you're going to have to come back so I can ask you about your mom in fashion. And I can ask you, like, I have so many other things that I want to ask you about, but that's just too story good of a time, note to end Stephanie on. Story, story time virtually. We've got time and plenty of stories, talking stories in a novel way. Story time with Stephanie's story.